welcome to Goldfish on Gaming. And after successfully getting this Amstrad PPC640 up and running last week, it was time to start looking at a few upgrades. Now, I think we'll all agree that that LCD, while great for the time, is not particularly good for gaming. And so I wanted to get some form of colour output from the machine. And so I typed in CGA to VGA adapters into various search engines and market sites and came across two devices. The first one was this, a CGA to VGA adapter board, which also acts as upscaler and scan doubler. It takes in a 15 pin VGA connector, but also has a couple of headers as well. Now seeing that this device has a 9 pin output, I needed some way to connect it to the board. And that's where a 9 pin to 15 pin adapter came into place. Now with the two of these, I figured it would be pretty quick to start getting some proper video out of it. After connecting up the board and turning it on, we get our LCD. But thankfully, there was a way to quickly switch to the CRT. And what do we get? Ugh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So after my initial attempts at getting this board to work with that cable, nothing I tried would work. There was an on-screen menu I messed around with, there was switching between all the different input types, I even tried connecting pins directly from the video output into the board. None of them made any difference. So I was going to have to spend some time really looking into what CGA actually was. And surprisingly, it actually uses a digital video format called RGBI TTL, or Red Green Blue Intensity Transistor to Transistor Logic. The way the format worked is that the four color components gives us 16 combinations, which matches up to the 16 colors that CGA supports. It was then up to the monitor to assign actual color values to those numbers. And for the most part, it was a simple formula, apart from color six, which was actually brown rather than dark yellow. With this knowledge, I now knew I needed a digital to analog converter if I was going to plug this into any of my monitors or capture cards. And so I started looking for one and found this Commodore 128 to RGBS or red, green, blue sync converter. Thankfully, RGBS is a pretty common analog video format, so I was going to have no difficulties in using it. You can see it has the 9 pin on one side, and I've soldered on a set of pins on the back to provide power, because it's an active converter, and then the red, green, blue, sync, and ground. I still needed the scan doubler, as it could provide power to the converter board. I would then take the pins from there into one of the headers, near the VGA input. This would then allow it to double the 15 kilohertz sync rate from the CGA up to the 30 kilohertz of VGA. We could then use its on-screen display to move the image around and make sure it was all correct. Oh yeah! That's exactly what I was hoping for. And you know what this means? Let's play some Lemmings. Look at that CGA goodness. Now obviously I'm going to have to try and tweak some of the settings on this board because the colours aren't quite right and I think that's the upscaler. But hey, we actually have a colour output. Now I'm just going to try and work out how to play Lemmings 
with a keyboard. And I have no idea. Oh, oh, wait. Got left, right, yes. Down, and up. And how do I select the types? With the video sorted, it was now time to look at storage. A hard drive would have been the most ideal solution to this, and some of the later models actually came with a built-in hard drive. But it turns out this was actually an aftermarket option, where you had to take out the modem card and replace it with this hard drive controller card, which was then soldered directly to the motherboard. You then had to worm a cable through to where the floppy drives are, and one of the floppy drives had to be sacrificed as a space to put the hard drive in. Now I did look for these cards, but they seemed to be very very rare, which meant I had to go with my backup option, and that one was a GoTech. Now this replaces one of the floppy drives, and you just plug in a USB stick, and it has all the floppy drive data on it. And as far as the system is concerned, it's just talking to a floppy disk, but you can change which disk you're currently using through the buttons. And makes for a nice and easy way of being able to get far more software and games onto a machine. Now I've used this with my Windows 95 machine and my Amiga, and they both work great there, so I envision there being very few issues. To gain access to the floppy drives, we need to take off the top part of this case, which is normally screwed down, but I've removed those already. There's also a switch that, when pressed, makes a beeping sound, which I'm assuming is there to warn you that you've closed the machine without turning it off. You're then going to try and remove this caddy, which is a real pain. You've got to pull the cables out of the way, to give you room so you can then shove and push the caddy around until eventually it pops out. And there we have it. Now with that out of the way, I can now pull out the cables for the flop second floppy drive. And for now, I'm just going to plug the GoTech directly into the device without putting it into the caddy, so I can just test it out. And with a USB stick, we're all ready to go. Well crap, that wasn't what I was hoping for. Let's try again. And one last. Right, time to go back to the drawing board. Nothing I tried would make this device work with my machine. And it turns out there's two versions of the GoTech. There is the high density 1.44 megabyte version and the double density 720 kilobyte version. Now they will ignore whatever size of image you've put on the drive 
and always report their base size to the OS. Now this is a problem as the PPC640 really only supports double density drives. So I had one of two options. I could either buy another GoTech that was a double density drive version or I could try replacing the firmware on one of my devices with something newer. Now there's two main options at the moment. There's HXC and there's Floppy Flash. They both have positives and negatives and in the end I decided to go with the HXC firmware. The simple reason for this was that it supported more platforms as I wanted to try this drive in other machines and its IBM support is far more stable. So I flashed my old Amiga drive. Time to try again. Now please work. Success! Well, I guess I'm just going to have to play this game now, aren't I? Well, this has to be CGA. Well, here's the classic CGA palette in all its pink glory. Let's just try the first level. It's been quite some time since I've played this. Now, let's try and work out the keyboard controls. And, yep, got some movement. And, yep, space to blow. Now how do I rotate? Ah. Oh, can I get this one? With the level complete, I think it's time to start putting this all back together again. So first of all, I'm going to unplug the GoTech, so I can then flip the caddy around and unscrew the disk drive I don't need anymore. Thankfully, it's just a couple of screws, and the drive should pop out quite easily. And yep, it just slides out. Now I have to push the GoTech all the way through to the back because it's not actually as long as a regular floppy drive. And this makes it far easier to now reconnect the cables. And in they go. And now the power, which isn't as long as the main cable, so I'm going to have to flip it back around again so I can actually get access to it. With that in place, I can now push the drive back forwards. I can now flip it over again and screw the GoTech in place. The shortness of some of these cables make it really awkward to actually work with. I'm guessing Amstrad really were paying by the inch when it came to their cabling to try and keep the costs down. But thankfully they made it easy enough to get into their hardware we can do things like this with both screws in it's now time to wrestle with that caddy again so it's got two prongs at the front that you have to hook under and then it's got some tabs at the back that you then got to hook behind to try and keep it in place with it in place we can now put the closed switch into place and try and wrestle this top plate back where it's meant to be which again is mostly held on by a couple of tabs and brute force and luck and there we go 
And you know what? That doesn't actually look too bad. If it was a darker grey, that would have looked almost stock. Actually, quite nice. Well, after playing both those games, there was something I was missing, and that was a mouse. As both those games both play far better with the mouse than with the keyboard. Now, the machine itself doesn't have a PS2 port, unsurprisingly, but it does have the big 25 pin serial port. I'm hoping that a 25 pin to 9 pin adapter will do the trick. So let's load up the mouse driver. In this case, I'm just using CT mouse. And that seems to have loaded. Now to run Bubble Ghost again. And yeah, it seems to work fine. Far, far easier to play than with the keyboard. Far more responsive. And I complete the level quite easily. Just realized I never tried the mouse buttons, so let's give them a quick go. And they both seem to work great. Well, with that looking great, I wanted to try Lemmings. And straight away, it seems to have picked up a mouse. But for some reason, it didn't seem to work on that menu. I'm hoping it actually does better in game. Now let's see. And not having much luck so far. Damn. This is, I'm guessing, not going to work. Let's see if I can actually click on the lemmings themselves. And nope. Nope, this is not working at all. I hope it's just the game and not the mouse or the driver. So I'm going to try one other game to be sure. And that has to be Maniac Mansion. Now straight off, hey, it seems to be working. I can select people on the menu. Now the mouse is lagging quite a bit, so I'm guessing this game really wasn't designed with the 8088 in mind. But at least we get that funky music. They really did do wonders with the PC speaker. Well, let's get into the game and see if I can move around. I forgot how much talking there is before he actually had <laughs> to play. Yay, and control. And yes, the mouse seems to be working great here. I'm going to guess it's some problem with lemmings and not the mouse driver or the hardware. Well, this is good to know. I guess I'm going to have to try and find another version of lemmings or... I'll have to stick with the Amiga version instead. Wow, this game does not look particularly great in CGA mode, does it? And I feel that neatly brings us to the end of this episode. I had so much fun in restoring and upgrading this machine that in some ways I wish it would continue. So if you've got any ideas for what you'd like me to do with this machine next, leave me a message in the comments. And until next time, I've been the Goldfish, and this has been Goldfish on Gaming.